Good morning. How you doing, Bob? I'm very well. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Uh, it's uh, past the time, so let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you all to the City of Portsmouth Planning Commission work session. Today, Thursday, November 5th, 2020, being held in the Microsoft Team platform via video conference. Please note that this meeting will be recorded. Commissioners are asked to mute their microphones when they're not speaking and to verbally identify themselves prior to making any comments. Madam Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, this is Regina Jackson, Planning Administrative Assistant. I will now confirm that all members of the Planning Commission are present and can hear me by calling the roll. Commissioners, when I call your name, please reply with a verbal response. Commissioner Williams. Present. Commissioner Thompson. Present. Commissioner Youngblood. Here. Commissioner Saxton. Present. Commissioner G. Commissioner Coleman. Present. Commissioner Page. Five members of the Planning Commission are present. This public meeting of Planning Commission is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Northam's March the 12th, 2020 Executive Order and Council Ordinance 2020-102. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth, given the outbreak of COVID-19, a quorum of the Commission is not physically present in the meeting location but members have joined remotely. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you will find posted on the city's planning department webpage with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to entirely remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will be recorded. Even if members of the public do not provide public comment, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, Planning Commission is convening by video conference via Microsoft Teams app as posted on the city's website, identifying how the public may watch or listen to the meeting. Announcements of any future meetings and conferences. Please note that our next scheduled meeting is Tuesday, November the 17th, 2020 at 1.30 p.m. The meeting will be held in Microsoft Teams platform via video conference. Our first work session item for this morning is the zoning rewrite update. And our staff coordinator for that is Julie Chop. Uh, Madam Secretary and Ms. Chop, please allow me to interrupt just a moment to acknowledge that we are joined by Councilman Lucas Burke, and it's always a pleasure to have her here. Uh, Commission, uh, Ms. Cha. You're muted, Julie. Hold on one second, if you don't mind, this is Bob Baldwin, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a couple of comments before we get started with the briefing. Um, I think you're all aware this is a, uh, a work session on the rewrite of the zoning ordinance. We've been working on this for quite some time. Um, this is really part of a two part work session. Uh, you've been getting your, your last meeting. We did the D2 um, um, rezoning, the uh, council directed um, replacement of the D2 form based code. Today we're going to focus on the, the remainder of the zoning ordinance, although the D2 piece will be will be discussed as well. Um, uh, we'll be pointing out early on what the direction was from city council. I just want to note couple, some, a couple of the comments we've received from the public made people aware the uh, the staff works specifically on the items as directed by city council when we're doing a task such as this. Uh, we were not directed to do a wholesale redo of the city's zoning map. 
And so we have not proposed zoning map changes with the exception of the D2 district, which was specifically directed by city council. So there have been a couple of people have asked, why haven't you rezoned my neighborhood or my lot or something? Just want to make it make people aware that was not uh, the task. That's a whole completely different project to um, take on the city's uh, full zoning map. And we did not do that as part of this project. Um, would like to take a moment as we get further along in this process to thank publicly thank uh, Julie Chop and Meg Pittenger, uh, particularly for their hard work on this thing. This has been quite a, uh, a long running project and it's been very intensive work, especially over the last um, six to, to 10 months trying to get us to this point today. But we've been trying to get this thing wrapped up this calendar year. <clears throat> I think as the vice mayor is aware, the council would like to have this thing done if possible this calendar year. So we've been working along on that schedule. And so I just mentioned a couple of scheduling things. Um, we will be briefing city council on, on both this and the D2 at their meeting next um, Tuesday. And then the following Tuesday, as um, Regina Jackson noted, the planning commission meeting on the 17th will be in fact your public hearing on both of those items. And, and if um, everything stays on schedule, this will actually go to city council on the 24th of November for public hearing and first reading. Uh, with the target of getting this to City Council on their one and only scheduled meeting in December, uh, December the 8th for second reading. So if all um, stays on schedule, that would be the goal to get this process through by December the 8th. The um, targeted um, actual implementation date of the ordinance and the rezone would be February the 1st. Um, that would give us time to uh, allow uh, a few existing applications we have in the process to clear without getting tangled up in between the switch over of the zoning ordinance. Uh, it also will give us time to um, do some staff training, some uh, orientation for the new ordinance, and to make sure the public is aware that it's out there before it actually um, takes effect. So I did want to make those uh, statements before we get started. Again, there's a work session. Feel free to ask questions, any comments you might have. Um, we'll try to keep this as brief as we can. It's obviously a long topic, um, and City Council spent quite a bit of time um, early on in the process, giving us direction. We had a number of work sessions and hopefully uh, by the time we get through today, you'll be able to see that both the Planning Commission and Council who were really participating in joint work sessions most of the time. We believe we've addressed uh, those things we were asked to take to take care of as as well as the other things that you know we would we would do normally. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor back over to Julie Chop, and then Julie's going to walk us through the um, the presentation this morning. And um, thanks again for your time and attention this morning. Appreciate your uh, willingness to participate in this um, special meeting today. Hi everyone. Hi planning commissioners. Um, this is Julie Chop, planner with the City of Portsmouth. Uh, this meeting today is being recorded and will be available on the city's planning department website. The, the first draft of the rewritten zoning ordinance was posted in January and public comments were received through March of 2020. Staff has been working diligently to incorporate the necessary changes and revise the rewritten zoning ordinance so it's ready for adoption. The final draft of the zoning, or zoning ordinance was posted for public comment on September 20th, along with an explanatory briefing and PowerPoint presentation. I gave a brief overview of the process and major changes of the City Council directed zoning ordinance rewrite at the Planning Commission work session on February 28th, 2020. This presentation will give a more detailed overview of the rewritten zoning ordinance and I will go through each section of the rewritten ordinance and describe the major changes. So the organization and format of the zoning ordinance was simplified to include all zoning related information in one document and to remove unnecessary um, verbiage. The organization was restructured for a more logical flow. So Article 1 is the general provision section. Uh, this article contains the same information as the current general provision, provision section, but the language has been simplified and unnecessary wording has been removed. Okay. Um, article 2 contains information on the city zoning districts. The zoning districts established table was made more comprehensive by including the subdistricts of the of historic residential, historic limited business, and historic limited office, 
and also lists the downtown D1 subdistricts sub of D1, T3, T4, T5, T6, and SD. The current ordinance organizes the districts into residential districts and business districts. Staff felt that this was confusing, so the rewrite has split the business districts into commercial districts, which includes the neighborhood mixed use, general mixed use, and high intensity mixed use, and industrial districts, light industrial and er and industrial, light industrial and industrial zoning district. And then uh, the residential districts include the neighborhood residential, general residential, urban residential, and multifamily urban residential. The URH density urban residential has been renamed to multifamily urban residential to better reflect the, oh, oh sorry, okay, to better reflect the intent of the district. This district is not necessarily high density, it is better described as multifamily urban residential. The Preservation Government District has been renamed to the Conservation District to better reflect the intent of this district. The Activity Center Districts um, that have never been used have also been removed. Okay. So within the um, Within this same zoning district section um, is the is also includes the information on the downtown districts and the sub districts. The densities have been revised based on in depth assessment and research and now reflect possible future densities in the area. I'll give you a minute to look at the, the changes in the chart. Article two contains a section on overlay districts. The area subject to review by the downtown design committee has been established as the downtown design overlay district. The area subject to design review has not been changed. This overlay was established to eliminate confusion on the boundaries of the area subject to DDC oversight. As I described in the presentation on October 6th, um, at the direction of City Council, the D2 form based code um, is proposed to be rezoned to traditional zoning districts, and an innovation overlay district is proposed to be superimposed over this area. A virtual planning town hall was held on October 21st to present the proposed changes and receive feedback from the property owners within the D2 area. The D2 proposed zoning map has been revised based on feedback from the town hall. And this, this map reflects those changes. And the if you would like more information or a to see the recording of the town hall, um, you can go to portsmouthva.gov and search innovation and the, the page on the innovation district and the D2 rezoning changes is available along with the updated map. Okay, so also within the overlay section of the zoning section district section article. Section. article. Section. Oh, okay. The entertainment overlay district that Planning Commission and City Council approved the adoption of recently is also included in the rewritten zoning ordinance. Use definitions can now be found before the use table in Article 2 of zoning districts. Unnecessary uses were removed and use definitions were revised to be clear and concise. The port facility use was added to the industrial use category within the warehouse and freight subcategory. One of the definitions that was clarified in the rewrite was the definition of uh, entertainment establishment. The new definition distinguishes entertainment establishments as those with entertainment and serving alcohol. The use table was updated to reflect City Council directed initiatives. A use permit will no longer be required for multifamily residential uses in the D1, T4, T5, and T6 subdistricts. A use permit will not be required 
for convenience stores with gasoline sales in the GMU, MUH, IL, and IN zoning districts, and where permitted drive throughs will no longer require a use permit. The use specific standards follow the use table in the, the updated zoning ordinance uh, over prescriptive, over pres, pres, I can't, over prescriptive standards were removed. Um, a major change with this rewrite was that all distance separators were removed that have um, previously inhibited development in the past. Use standards were added for vending uses and renewable energy use standards were added for um, accessory and principal use for solar and wind energy. The zoning district art article also contains the area bulk density building and setback standards. All of the dimensional standards for the residential districts are in one table. The commercial and industrial district dimensional standards are in another table. Uh, modifications were made based on public comments to the district lot sizes and lot widths and buildings that must be elevated for flood zone regulations or that are elevated due to a ground floor parking structure will not be counted towards the maximum height permitted in the zoning ordinance in the zoning district. Article three contains the information that was in the former development standards section. The off street parking loading and circulate circulation section was recently updated in 2017, so there were not a lot of significant changes. The off street minimum parking standard for self storage facilities and the parking standard for daycares was updated. In light of COVID-19 commercial development changes, curbside pickup standards were also added. We added standards for utilizing valet parking to meet the required off street parking requirement. The landscape, the landscaping and screening section is also within Article three. The tree protection section was previously a separate section within the ordinance and staff decided to incorporate this section within the landscaping and screening section. The tree canopy section of chapter 36 of the city code was also incorporated into the landscaping and screening section so that all the standards are in the same document. Fences and walls. Um, this section was revised to remove unnecessary requirements and the standards within residential districts were revised to be more neighborhood friendly. The exterior lighting section of the community development standards article were updated to reflect advances in technology and safety as seen on the chart in this slide. The signage section was recently updated in 2018. The structure of the, the organization and structure was updated to make the section more user friendly. Uh, blade signs have been renamed to banner pole signs to more accurately describe what they are. Uh, the outdoor advertising sign definition and standards were added to the section as well. A standardized requirement was set for a 10% of the development site area for open space set asides for three to four family townhouse, multifamily and multifamily residential development, as well as mixed use development. The green building incentive section has been renamed to resilient site and building bonuses to more accurately reflect the intent of this section. The menu of features that are available to developers for incentives was updated to reflect modern sustainable building and design techniques. Developers also have the opportunity to request the use of an innovative strategy for resilient development. So Article 4 contains the standards for nonconformities. The 
non-conforming site aspect requirements that created a heavy financial burden for businesses wishing to expand their their business was removed. The special exception process has been utilized to request allowance of expanding and continuing non-conforming uses, structures, and lots. The current ordinance only allows a non-conforming lot to be developed with a single family dwelling. The rewrite allows non-conforming lots to be used for any use permitted within that district. The administrative section has been moved to Article 5 at the end of the ordinance. The use permit and rezoning review standards have been simplified to reflect city council's discretionary ability that aligns with the state code. Zoning violation infractions have been moved from criminal penalties to civil penalties to hopefully increase the effectiveness. As mentioned earlier, the use of special exceptions has been expanded to create an expedited process through the BZA for modifications to authorize alternative signage, alternative parking, to authorize fences taller than eight feet, expansion of nonconformities, and to request modification due to Chesapeake Bay Protection Area regulations. The site plan section has been revamped to clarify site plan types, major site plan, minor site plan, and single family site plans. It has also been clarified within this section, the, the current operating procedure of the site plan submittal requirements and approval authority under the city engineer. Zoning ordinance is the definition section. Uh, this section also serves as somewhat of a glossary. All of the terms with the, within the zoning ordinance are found in this section and are hyperlinked to the definition or the appropriate section for further information on that term. Staff has worked very hard to ensure that one term is consistently used throughout the ordinance to prevent confusion and misinterpretation. The term port was also defined, which was a particular um, concern for city council. So the in terms of next steps, the planning department has many initiatives that will commence after the adoption of this revised ordinance. As you know, the graphics have been written ordinance and a development procedures manual is being developed with the help of our consultant WSP to include user-friendly information on the development processes. We also plan to revamp staff reports for planning applications to reflect the changes that have been made. Uh, we feel that an interactive user-friendly zoning map is essential to increasing our transparency and guiding Portsmouth citizens through the development process. A consultant will likely be hired to expedite this process. As described in the October work session, the an innovation overlay district master plan and placemaking strategy will be developed to enhance the functionality of the overlay district with extensive public participation. We also plan to revisit the downtown standard or the district standards for the downtown district to, to ensure they are compatible with desired growth. So I realized this was a lot of information. Uh, my email address is on this slide. It is chop, C-H-O-P-J at PortsmouthVA.gov. I'd be happy to clarify any information or answer any questions. Uh, more information on the zoning ordinance rewrite is also available on the city's website at the link on this slide. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, commissioners, I will now call each of your names to see if you have any questions for Ms. Chop. I have none. Commissioner Thompson? Uh, yeah, I think um, clarification for an entertainment establishment. What about um, existing uh, establishments that um, are in, within the 250 feet of a daycare facility or something like that? How will they be affected by this? Well, um, 
Well, if they're existing, then that means they've already been approved for the um, for the variance of the the two the distance separator. But with this, all those distance separators, like that two hundred fifty feet from a church or daycare, those have all been removed. So any new establishment that that wanted to open up that was close to a a church or a daycare would be able to do that with they would still have to get a use permit but that di distance separator requirement is no longer there okay i got you this um, is um this is bob if i might just jump in one second this yeah. is bob baldwin i just want to follow up on um on amy's question there one thing that we did check back with the um zoning administrator because as as um, we had noted in the beginning uh, question was something that city council was interested in when we went through the um, initial uh, work sessions um, on this thing and according to uh, mr millhouse i think he said since 2015 the board of zoning appeals has actually had 15 uh, variance applications to try to get get out of this uh, distance separated thing it's been quite a detriment to a lot of potential uh, development activities in course with and I, I think that just you know the normal rule of thumb is if you start to get that kind of um, activity to your board of zoning appeals looking at something you probably have something wrong with your ordinance and so i think um it seems to be pretty clear pretty clear um evidence for us that the distance separators were not having the uh, the, the desired effect other than to force um a lot of projects into the uh, board of zoning appeals application process okay thank you um i, I had one other question regarding uh site plan major versus minor versus single family could you clarify that one a little bit? OK, um, the, the, the site plan. I'm sorry. Yes. Please. OK, um, so I believe that major or minor site plan is for um, if it's 200 2,500 square feet or above, and then a major site plan, I believe, is more than an acre. Meg Pittenger, you can chat in here. Yeah. Um, so a minor site plan is is under 250, 2,500 square feet, and major is above that. And single family is, you know, is is what it is. Um, most of that is going to, you know, involve submission requirements. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that involves uh, soil and erosion control, uh, erosion and soil sediment control procedures. Um, but that's that's what the, the breakdown is, is that minor site plans, which don't require as much detail um, to be submitted to the city, is going to be 2,500 square feet and less, and, and major is going to be above that. The acre comes in is terms of whether they need a construction general permit for um, land disturbance and that's a state permit but um the breakdown is going to be that we've had that breakdown it's just that now we've clear clarified that in the code that that's where the division is um and the city engineer will have that authority to determine um what submittal requirements are required for each of those and obviously for single family you know the the requirement they still obviously have to have site plan and all that other kind of stuff but the requirement is is less to make that not as onerous a process for those people doing individual single family development okay so that single family category is for basically a new construction yeah new, con new construction that's correct okay. and new construction may also involve a structure that's taken all the way down to the foundation and rebuilt like due to fire or flood or something like that the city engineer will determine that it, it's you know that's not just repair at that point if they take it all the way down to the foundation and that will require to go through the full single family site plan process which has its own process that it goes through with the city yeah, okay. this is um this is bob baldwin again i'm gonna follow up on that, on that single family site plan that, that's actually a process that was um we've, we've instituted um uh, just about two years ago we've, we've been uh, modifying as we went um, I think this year we've already processed over 140 of those. So um, having been able to create a more streamlined uh, process for these single family uh, site plans has allowed that site plan process to uh, literally take less than a week. In some cases, as, as, as little as um, one day or two days on the site plan, depending on the, the quality of the submission. So that's been a real 
a real help in getting um, a lot of the, the new single family construction you see going on around town through the process quickly without getting it tangled up in a lot of uh, more onerous site plan requirements that aren't really relevant to uh, the uh, intensity of the development. Okay. okay, thank you. Commissioner Youngblood. Yes, sir. Um, Julie, I've got two questions. In reference to uh, your energy conservation chapter here, I would I, I would think that you're talking about solar on top of the house and how would that affect the houses in the historic district? Okay, um, so yeah, we added um, a an accessory use for for solar and a um, a principal use for solar. So the principal would obviously be like a utility scale solar farm, and then the accessory use of the um, for solar, we have, they each have um, specific uh, use standards that they must comply with. So I can look those up really quickly and let you know. But I I don't, I believe that in the historic district, if um, I can let Bob, Bob yeah. speak. Let me, let me uh, thank you, this is Bob Baldwin again. In the um, historic district, just like most things, uh, uh, there's no there's no there's no exemption for putting solar on a on a historic structure that's um, you know any portion of the structure visible from a public right of way so I'm attempting um, um, to put solar panels on a historic district would still have to go through the um, HPC process um, for approval for doing that and at some point um, in the near future and, and this question this uh, discussion came up with city council uh, recently on the, on, a, on an HPC appeal, we're going to be looking to go back and, and update the city's um, historic district uh, design guidelines so we can take a look at some certain things. Uh, one of those being, um, you know, raising structures due to issues with um, flood zones and flood protection. And I think some of these other things such as um, solar panels and dealing with um, um, 5G um, uh, technology being installed through historic districts, we're going to want to um, address in the in an updated set of design guidelines. Along those same lines, uh, you referenced chain link fences. I I would guess that 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 falls into the same category. Um, that would it would have to be addressed in the the revised guidelines. Is that correct? Well, yeah. And the historic well, districts have their own set of fence standards. Um, which would be separate from the ones that, that were referenced on that slide, which apply to non-historic districts. Historic districts are still regulated specifically through what's allowed within each district. Okay, thank, thank you very much. That answers my questions. Commissioner Thaxton. I don't have any questions right now. Uh, I don't think Commissioner G has joined the call session. Commissioner G, if you're there, I don't see you. Okay, Commissioner Coleman. Commissioner Coleman. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thanks, Julie. Um, I appreciated the presentation. Um, you answered one of my questions regarding the online fees for citizens. Um, but I did have one question regarding the open space, uh, 10%. How is that? Is that going to be like recreational space or is that open or playgrounds? So that that 10% is um, it's it's passive recreation is permitted, I believe, and um it's let me i know we have specific so meg what is what all can include in the open space yeah so if you look in that section you know there's a lot of different things that can be included in that um you know it can be playgrounds it can be you know just just open undeveloped space um, it's not, you know, like between the sidewalk and the curb, that kind of thing, but it, it is, you know, dedicated open space for the use of the people in the 
residential or mixed use developments. Um, you know, and, and it, can, it can be buffer areas, it can be, you know, landscape areas. But again, and, and again, that's not really a new standard. Um, we've had open space standards for multifamily um, development already in the ordinance. We just clarified it. And I think in some cases it was actually more than 10% in the current, current ordinance. It may have been up to 15 um, in the current ordinance. And so we, we clarified it so that it's 10%. And there are specific things that that we'll look at that they can apply. But again, it's intended to be, you know, recreational type space, you know, for use within that development, whether it's a, you know, a plaza or, you know, a park or, or something like that. We don't specify that it has to be these things or it has to like used to be we required that you must provide a playground. You know, in a residential neighborhood, like it's not that prescriptive. Um, but there's a, a menu of items that they can that they can choose to include to meet that requirement. Okay, so we're basically leaving it up to the developer who I guess knows the market for what he's building. Right within within the items that are permitted, you know, within that that particular code section. But yes. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Thank you, Commissioner Page. questions at the moment thank you uh commissioner thompson did you have your hand raised for another question yes commissioner um so that 10 percent is in addition to whatever bmp requirements there might be i believe yeah, that that's correct go ahead Meg, no, go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's that, correct. That's you know, correct. BM, BMPs are not going to, you know, BMPs can be included, um, you know, as part of the calculation. You look, it's, it's in that menu. Um, but whether or not they have to include BMPs is irrespective of the open space. Like, it's two separate requirements, um, you know, under, you know, that's going to be a stormwater thing versus, you know, this is, you know, dedicated open space. And like I said, they're, you know, they can include some of those things. I think it's, we allowed them to include fewer things. We, we tried to make it include things that made sense, not just here's a bunch of crappy land that you can't develop and we'll call it open space, which is kind of what happens sometimes in some areas. We, we tried to make it so that it is space that can be utilized, you know, by the people within that development without specifying you must have a charcoal grill and a gazebo and a bench and a playground which is what used to happen in the previous code before 2010 even that we would be very prescriptive of what they had to include we want to let them decide what you know again what what the market forces might require what they think is appropriate again within that menu of items that are appropriate okay thanks uh Commissioners, are there any further um, questions or discussions on this topic at this time? If there being none, Madam Secretary, I believe that concludes our work session for today. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just want to acknowledge, if I could, the new planning commissioner, Commissioner Page, who has joined this morning as new commissioner on our board. The um, Hi. Good morning. How are you all doing? Good. Commissioner Page, do me a favor. Unlock your 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 uh, camera and let us see what you look like. <laughs> okay. Let me. Okay. Well, there you are. All right. Good morning. Well, now I can associate with a, a face with the name because we did talk uh, earlier this week, and I did welcome him to uh, to the planning commission. Who's that? Uh, oh, I don't know him. That's the new commissioner. Please uh, forgive my tardiness. Uh, I'm new to team. I'm a Zoomer. So uh, you, you have to apologize. I had to reset a whole lot of passwords for me to be able to get on. So I, I called as much as I could. I'm doing Zoom. I'm doing team. I'm doing Skype. I'm doing FaceTime. And each one of them is different. So you have to go in and go, OK, which am I going to do today? <laughs> But welcome. It's a pleasure Thank to have you join us. Thank you all. Yes, you're very welcome. Uh, Commissioners, is, is there any other further business that we need to discuss? Mr. Chairman, this is Bob Baldwin. Mike, can I make one uh, one comment? Sure. Before we, um, before we wrap it up today. Yeah. Um, and first, I'd like to welcome our new uh, planning commissioner, Mr. Page. Um, 
like to first offer the, uh, the plan uh, department and the planning department staff to you if you have any questions. I know you have a lot of catching up to do. This project's been going on now for over three years, so you've got a little bit of a of a steep curve to run up, but uh, we'd be glad to help you in any way we can. And I'd also like to extend that to the rest of the planning commissioners. If you have any questions for us uh, at any time, just let us know. We'd like to make sure we answer all of your questions. Um, and the same thing goes for um, the vice mayor as well and anyone else on the city council if they're if they're listening in or, or catch this in a, a recorded session. So if you have any questions, um, this is on a tight time frame to try to get us through. So we'd like to try to answer any questions you have along the way because um, as I mentioned with the schedule this morning, uh, this will go for you know public hearing with you on the um, uh, your upcoming meeting on the 17th. That's going to write the next week the city council. There's not a, a lot of uh, time built into the schedule to make um, you know, too many changes without affecting the schedule too much. So anything we might be able to do when the um, earlier stages up front before we get there would be uh, would be very helpful to us. Um, I just leave it at that and I'd like to again thank everyone for their time this morning and your questions and uh, your assistance all the way along in this um, process. It's been uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barwin. Uh, Commissioners, before we conclude, let me remind you that we are meeting November 17th, 2020 at 1.30. Uh, that's a Tuesday and we'll be held, the meeting will be held in the Microsoft Team platform via video conference. If there's no other, no other questions or discussions for uh, this morning, and again, thank you for joining us, uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Bye.